Hello, thanks for stopping by, and welcome to the third and final part of this series in which we explore the special group of tube stations that's named after pubs. We've looked at the stories behind Swiss Cottage, Royal Oak, Angel and Manor House so far. I'll provide a link to those episodes in the description in case you missed them. The last two stations are both on the Bakerloo line, so let's head down and see where things take us. The name of this rather handsome station has its roots in a pub known as the Hero of Maida. The hero in question being a fellow named General Sir John Stuart, who was celebrated for leading 4,800 troops to victory at the Battle of Maida, which occurred during the Napoleonic Wars. Maida itself is a town in Calabria, southern Italy, which to be frank looks absolutely stunning. This is the present incarnation of the Hero of Maida, which you'll find on Sherland Road. The original however stood here, at the point where Edgware Road becomes Maida Vale. The stretch of road known as Maida Vale has gone by several names over the years. It's now classed as part of the A5, although 2000 years ago it was part of the Romans Watling Street. In around 1807, this section was given the name Maida Hill, presumably in honour of the Battle of Maida, which had occurred in July the previous year, and the hero of Maida Pub was established not long after, in 1810. Like the other pubs we've encountered in this series, the Hero of Maida was located in open fields when it first opened, a good distance from the sprawl of London. Things began to develop a few years later though, when the Regent's Canal, which links the Grand Union Canal to Limehouse Basin, was routed through the area. This new waterway opened in 1820, creating the delightful area now known as Little Venice, and passing very close to the Hero of Maida, before plunging into the Maida Hill Canal Tunnel. As such, advantage was taken of the pub's proximity by having pleasure boats stop here to pick up passengers, a service which you can see advertised in this old clipping, which offers trips up to Chalk Farm. As well as boats, the Hero of Maida also became an important stop for horse-drawn omnibuses, which, in the days before the underground, were a very handy way of getting around. In the 1840s, for example, you could catch an omnibus from here to London's financial heart at Bank Junction for just tuppence. Oh, I imagine it would have been a pretty slow and bumpy ride. Again, as with the other tube pubs we've seen previously, it would seem the Hero of Maida underwent a complete rebuild at some point, as this structure appears to date from the mid to late 19th century. Unfortunately, I've not been able to find a reference for this, so if you have any info, please do let me know in the comments. The first incarnation of the Hero of Maida closed in the 1990s, although as you can see, the tall post which once bore the tavern sign still remains in place. The second embodiment of the Hero of Maida, which we saw at the start of this segment, is very recent, although the building itself dates back to 1878, when it opened as the Sherland Hotel. It was later renamed to the Truscott Arms, and continued to serve in that guise until 2016, when the owners were forced out of business, due to the landlord raising the rent from £75,000 to £250,000 per year. Yeah, you heard that right, grand, an increase of £175,000. It's crazy, isn't it? In the wake of its closure, the Truscott Arms was almost turned into, no prizes for guessing, luxury flats. Thankfully, the property was acquired by the Harcourt Inns Group, the price tag being a cool £5 million, and it's reopened as a gastro pub in 2018, adopting the Hero of Maida name in the process. They even have a beer named the Hero of Maida on tap, which is very nice indeed. Okay, now let's go and have a look at the station. Maida Vale Tube Station opened on Sunday the 6th of June 1915 as part of a Bakerloo Line extension towards Queen's Park. Prior to that, the Bakerloo Line, which began running in 1906, had operated between Paddington and Elephant and Castle, the latter of which we'll be seeing a lot more of later. The Bakerloo name, in case you were wondering, was coined by a journalist when the line first opened as a squashed up way of saying the Baker Street and Waterloo Railway Company, who were responsible for building it. That official title sounds like a bit of a mouthful, doesn't it? So it's no surprise the Bakerloo name caught on very quickly. 
Whilst we're on the subject of names, it's also worth noting that the Baker Lou's Maid of Vell wasn't the first station to incorporate that title. That accolade goes to Kilburn and Maid of Vell station, which opened in 1852 as part of the London and North Western Railway. That station changed its name to Kilburn High Road in the autumn of 1923, and is now part of the Overground Network. Tiled and Oxblood Red, Maid of Vell's beautiful station building is based upon the standardised design created by the incredible architect Leslie Green, who himself was born in Maid of Vell. Tragically though, Leslie never got to see this station as he died of tuberculosis in 1908, aged just 33. Leslie's assistant, therefore, Stanley Heaps, who himself would go on to design a number of his own tube stations, was responsible for the work carried out here. There's a slight difference with Maid of Vell compared to other Leslie Green designs though, and that's that this station is only one storey high. The older stations were two storeys, the reason being that they used lift to connect the ticket hall to the platforms, and therefore needed space to house the lift machinery. Maid of Vell, on the other hand, was one of the earliest stations to be designed with escalators in mind, and as such didn't require that extra bit on top. Because it opened during World War I, Maid of Vell was also the very first tube station to be staffed entirely by women. There were 10 employees in this pioneering group, whose ages ranged between 18 and 25, and they were all trained at Kilburn Park Station, which had opened just a few months before. Today, no one would bat an eyelid, and rightfully so of course, but in 1915, this setup was seen as quite an oddity, and as such was widely covered in the press. One newspaper, for example, deemed it a novel experiment, whilst another writer quipped, will the maid avail? You know, very droll. As one account though, which appeared in the Daily Mirror, detailing the station's opening day, demonstrated, the female employees were more than capable of holding their own. One elderly man entered the station about midday and bought a ticket to Charing Cross, the report begins. He looked rather searchingly at the girl who gave him the ticket. At the barrier by the escalator, he mechanically held out his ticket to be punched. When a pretty girl quickly punched a ticket, he gave a little gasp of surprise. What? he cried. Are you the ticket collector? Yes, sir, said the girl briskly. All the staff are women at this station now. You will find a woman porter below if you need one. As the old gentleman sailed down the escalator, the girl gave a quick glance down the moving stairs. I hope he knows how to get off, she said. Being such a marvellous looking station, Maid of Vale has appeared on film numerous times over the years. The earliest example being Downhill, which was directed by Alfred Hitchcock in 1927. In this clip from that film, you can see Ivan Novello descending the station's wooden escalator. The sequence was shot in the early hours of the morning, when the station was closed, thus granting Hitchcock free reign of the building. In more recent years, the station was transformed into the fictitious Westbourne Oak for the 2014 film Paddington, which is rather appropriate, considering the Brown family discovered the little bear just a few stations along. Anyway, let us now head down the escalator too, and make our way towards the end of the Bakerloo line, and our final tube station pub. Although it bears one of London's most iconic place names, the current Elephant and Castle pub looks rather low key, it being a functional building dating from the 1960s. Even so, it does have an interesting interior. I certainly haven't seen many pubs with a ceiling like this, for example. Because it looks relatively modern though, it can be difficult to grasp just how historic the Elephant really is. Initially, the locality was home to a village known as Newington, which came under the manor of Walworth, and was recorded as such in a doomsday book way back in 1086. The name of that village lives on today in the road names Newington Causeway and Newington Butts, which is a reference to Target's Butts by the way, as archery was practiced here during medieval times. One of the earliest mentions of a tavern, known as the Elephant, can be found in Shakespeare's Twelfth Night, which was written in around 1601. In it, Antonio tells Sebastian that, in the south suburbs, at the Elephant is best to lodge. This line is intriguing, because although Twelfth Night is set in the area now classed as the Balkan Peninsula, the idea of the Elephant in the south suburbs is clearly a local reference. 
After all, Shakespeare's Globe Theatre was located just under a mile away from the area that we now know as Elephant and Castle, and it's a place the audience would have no doubt been familiar with. So who knows, maybe Shakespeare knew the tavern's owner and slipped this in as a cheeky bit of advertising. The Elephant and Castle really began to establish itself in 1760, when a blacksmith's workshop on Newington Butts was enlarged and converted into a tavern. I guess he'd had enough of bashing metal. The reason why the Elephant and Castle name was chosen though is something of a mystery. There are several theories though which I'll present to you now. Please do let me know in the comments which one you reckon is the most likely explanation. Maybe it was inspired by a chess piece, as during this era, the rook was often represented as an elephant with the castle turret strapped to its back. Nowadays, of course, we just get the castle bits. Or maybe the landlord was associated with the worshipful company of cutlers, cutlers being those craftsmen who made swords and cutlery. The symbol of this guild is an elephant with a castle on its back. You can see it on the sign for their livery hall, which is located on Warwick Lane, close to St Paul's Cathedral. Or do you think the phrase could be a corruption of Queen Eleanor of Castile, the first wife of Edward I? Or alternatively, as a French ambassador suggested in the 1930s, Infanta de Castile, Catherine of Aragon, Henry VIII's first wife. Lastly, and my own personal favourite I must say, could it perhaps be a reference to an elephant that was kept in a royal menagerie during the 13th century, the precursor to London Zoo, which for many years was located within the Tower of London. The elephant in question was a gift from King Louis IX of France to King Henry III, and the legend has it that the elephant later passed away after somehow managing to drink a rake of wine. Well at least he died happy I suppose. The expansion of the Elephant and Castle Tavern occurred at around the same time two new Thames crossings opened, namely Westminster Bridge and Blackfriars Bridge, which were unveiled in 1751 and 1769 respectively. The area already had a direct path to London Bridge, and so when roads leading to the two new crossings were laid out through Newington, it began to grow very busy around here indeed, meaning there was plenty of passing trade for the Elephant and Castle pub. Again, as with all the pubs we've seen in this series, the Elephant and Castle Tavern underwent several rebuilds to cope with this growth. The most impressive was built in 1898, and stood on an island at the heart of the junction, which by the turn of the 20th century, had become a major shopping and entertainment district, known as the Piccadilly of South London. Like Manor House, Elephant and Castle also became a major hub on London's tram network during this period. And as seen on this map, tram tracks looped all around the large pub. So integral was the area to the tram network in fact, that when a short documentary was made to commemorate the final week of service in 1952, it was entitled, The Elephant Will Never Forget. If you've not seen this film, it really is worth a watch, so I'll leave a link for it below. As with many tube stations during the Second World War, the platforms at Elephant and Castle were used by locals to shelter from air raids, whilst the area above was pounded by bombs. Indeed, during the Blitz, Elephant and Castle suffered very heavy damage, leaving it cratered and scarred. This in turn paved the way for a modern and controversial overhaul, which was carried out during the 1960s, turning the Elephant and Castle into a sprawling, car-dominated concrete junction, complete with two huge roundabouts and a labyrinth of grim pedestrian subways. Although the late Victorian pub survived the war, it was promptly demolished to make way for this development. But sadly, that's the way it goes around these parts. When the Elephant and Castle's 1960s shopping centre was demolished in 2021 to make way for trendy apartments in the boutique squares, that too is much lamented, as it was in fact quite a pioneer, and had come to play an important role in the local community. But at least one thing remains constant, and that's the tube station, so let's go and have a look. Elephant and Castle is one of the oldest deep level tube stations on the entire London Underground network. It opened on the 18th of December 1890 as part of the City and South London Railway, the pioneering electric railway that would later become part of the Northern Line, and which I explored in a little more detail in the previous episode when we looked at Angel. 
As with Maida Vale, and despite its age, Elephant and Castle Tube wasn't the first station to bear that name. Just around the corner, you'll find another Elephant and Castle station, which is part of the National Railway Network. This older cousin opened as part of the London Chatham and Dover Railway, way back in 1863. Back to the Tube, the original 1890s surface building was designed by the Irish-born architect Thomas Phillips Figgis, and its entrance stood at the southern end of the Elephant and Castle Junction, right behind the now vanished Victorian pub. As you can see, the entrance today is a glass box-like structure. But when it first opened in the late 19th century, the building looked very different indeed, and was topped with a dome, similar to the building at Kennington Station, which still survives. The Baker Street and Waterloo Railway, aka the Bakerloo Line, arrived here in 1906, and established a separate entrance, designed by Leslie Green, who we saw earlier, towards the northern end of Elephant and Castle. Thankfully, this building remains intact. An interesting view of Elephant and Castle Tube Station in its early days can be seen in this painting from 1918 by Walter Bays, which is entitled The Underworld, and depicts people taking shelter on the platforms during a Zeppelin air raid. You can see the painting on display at the nearby Imperial War Museum. Perhaps the best piece of trivia associated with Elephant and Castle Tube Station is that it was here, on the 13th of May 1924, that the very first baby to be born on the underground was delivered. I'm not sure how many there have been since then, though. The baby's mother was Daisy Hammond from Wildstone, and she went into labour whilst on the Bakerloo line at Marlebone Station. In response, the entire train was cleared, which was no mean feat considering it was during the evening rush hour, and then sped all the way to Elephant and Castle without stopping, the reason being that from there, Daisy could be quickly taken to Lambeth Infirmary. She gave birth, however, before she could be taken above ground, although both she and the baby, who was a girl, were fine. Despite a suggestion that she should name her baby Thelma Ursula Beatrice Eleanor, which would have given her the initials T-U-B-E, Tube, get it? Daisy instead opted for Mary Ashfield Eleanor, the middle name being in honour of Lord Ashfield, who was the Underground's chairman at the time. Lord Ashfield even agreed to become Mary's godfather, and presented the family with a silver mug for the christening, although he was reported as saying, it would not do to encourage this sort of thing, as I'm a busy man. He did add, however, that, as this is so far as I know, an event which is without precedent in the history of the Bakerloo, I think we ought to mark the occasion. Thank you so much for watching. I really hope you've enjoyed this series looking at London's tube pubs. I'd love to hear your thoughts on them. Do you have a favourite, or are there any particular special memories of these pubs and stations? Please be sure to let me know in the comments. Speaking of comments, I've received some really lovely ones during this Tube Pub series, and would like to express a very special thanks to all of you who left them. And if you subscribed recently too, welcome, it's great to have you here. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, it'd be great if you could please consider doing so, because this, along with clicking the bell icon to receive a notification, will ensure that you don't miss out whenever I publish a new video. You may also be interested to know that I have two books published, The Knowledge, Train Your Brain Like a Cabbie, and Waterloo, A History of London's Busiest Terminus along with an Etsy store where you'll find a wide range of hand-illustrated mugs, featuring illustrations of cabs, buses, tube trains and so on. Links are all in the description. For now, thanks again friends, stay well and please be sure to stay tuned.